Thanks, Pastor Zach. It's, uh, it's not a dad bod, it's a father figure. Just saying. So, hey, Pastor Weaver uh, just forgot to mention at the business meeting, uh, we have two deacons. Uh, spots that we need to vote on, and the names are Harley Northway, Gail Palmer, Daniel Murtha, and Todd Hartzler will be up. So it'll be important for you to show up, show out to that, so we can vote and get those spots filled. But it's good to be with you this morning. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, hello. hello. It's good to be in church with you this morning. So yep, Pastor Zach is right. I am a new dad, and we are loving it. My wife Jenna is the best. And I just want to show you a picture this morning of my son, Judah James. Judah James. So he is all Jenna uh, for sure, which is a good thing for him. Uh, but right after we took this picture, uh, we uh, may have lost this outfit due to some green and yellow up his back. So... He keeps us on our toes for sure, um, and he's doing awesome. He's just over a month old now, which is the absolute craziest thing in the world to think about how quickly it's gone. So we're blessed, uh, feeling good, and so thank you, church, for all your prayers and your gifts and, and just showering us with love. We're just so thankful for a church. But uh, mass service, good to see you. Anyone online watching? Blessings to you. We're glad that you're tuning in. And this morning, we're going to be jumping into Romans chapter 7. So you can turn there with me right now. Romans 7. We've been going through the book of Romans, as you know. And up to this point, uh, Paul had to hit a theme, uh, possibly beat uh, over our heads, a theme of we are sinners. We stink. We're not good enough. Uh, we'll never be good enough. And not only do we have sin, but we are in need of a Savior. And so verse or chapter 7, uh, I, that I want to break down. I feel like God's going to speak to us this morning. And just about, Paul like kind of breaks down this new relationship we have now with the law. The law. What is the law. Let me just reiterate uh, the law for you. We've talked about it up to this point so far in Romans. It's a major theme of our relationship with the law. Well, if you think all the way back that God, when he created us, he wanted a relationship with his people. He wanted a relationship with people. And when sin entered the world through us, through humans, we were sinful and had a sinful nature. He needed to do something to keep us in relationship with him because he was so holy, so set apart, so far above. So he had an idea that he would come up with a covenant, a covenant relationship with us. It was an agreement. It was a partnership between God and his people uh, that God would make promises and he would ask for commitments. He would make promises and he would ask for commitments from his people. And the law was the constitution of that agreement. It was the terms of the relationship that had to be kept by us. We knew God would keep his side and we had to keep our side. And so there were 613 commands that were given to ancient Israel, everything from social, relational, and spiritual commands that they were to do to keep themselves in to a relationship with God. And, and these are outlined in the first five books of the Bible, which are called the Torah. And, and, but even though this was a good plan, that God's law was perfect, as we'll find out from Paul says, we weren't. Adam and Eve came in the scene and we know sin entered through them. When God made a covenant with his people, he found out the more laws that he gave, the more opportunities they had to sin. <laughs> the, more, the more times he tried to help them out by giving them these perfect things to do, to keep them in a relationship with, them, with, with him, that we couldn't keep them. We couldn't keep our terms. And we still can't. And that's why Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament, and it says that he is the new covenant with us and God. 
He is the mediator between that. It says he came to fulfill the law. So he, co he was the only one that could complete the terms. He was the only one that could, that could, that could um, be sinless and follow all of the commands that God had. And so he, even though we were still sinful, he knows we couldn't be, we, we couldn't be perfect. We couldn't keep our side. Jesus keeps our side. And through him, now we can keep that covenant with God. Does it make sense? On the same track. So that's a big theme of it. So let's dive into Romans 7, starting in verse 1. Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law only applies, uh, applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. Just like in our culture today, it would be wrong, it would be adultery, it would be inappropriate. And if I just left my wife and married someone else and she was still alive, people would say, that's not good. You set up a law, you set up a commitment to her, and while she's still alive, I keep that. If she happened to pass away, and I know it's a little morbid, but this is what Paul describes it. If she were to happen to pass away, and then years down the road or whatever time period, I would remarry, it would be inappropriate for someone to come to me and say, hey, that's not okay. You made a commitment to your wife. You made a commitment to Jenna. And I would say, well, the law, that covenant no longer applies because death has changed the relationship. And that's a huge theme of this chapter. Through death, a relationship changes, and specifically to the law. And that's why Paul brings this illustration of a husband and wife to show that the believer, we have a different relationship now to the law because of our union with Jesus Christ. So you'd say, great, Jesus came, I'm the wife, the law was the husband, husband died, Jesus killed off the law, now we can live free for him. No, that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying the law didn't die, I died. The law did not die, we died. We died to the law. Picking up in verse four. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ, and now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. The law did not die because God's law still rules over men. His morality still rules over men, but we died to the law. And it no longer has dominion over us. What do I mean by that? Does that mean that we, we, we are lawless? That, yep, we don't have to, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. We're dead to it. It does not mean that we are lawless. It simply means that our motivation and our dynamic of our lives does not come from the law. It comes from God's grace through our new union, through our new relationship with Christ Jesus. Tracking? Verse 5. When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work in us. And the law aroused these desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds, resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, and here's the key, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. So we have been released from this power. We, have, we are no longer captive to it. And we can serve God, not in a way that's, that puts all the pressure on us to complete all of the commands, but instead that power is broken and now it's not on us any longer and it's on Jesus Christ. And through our relationship with him, we have right standing with God through the Holy Spirit as well. And so... The law, it, Paul talks about the law, it aroused sin, it results in death. And so some of his critics would say, well, well, that would make us lawless. Like, why, does, why didn't the law die instead of us? Why is it still around if we're dead to it? it it's sinful. It must be evil then. Is that what you're saying, Paul? And he, in verse 7 as we continue, would, would combat that. He would say, well then, am I suggesting the law of God is sinful? Of course not. 
In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would have never known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time I lived without the understanding of the law, but when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life and I died. I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me, and it used those commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, its commands are holy and right and good. How can that be? Did the law which was good cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. Oh, that's a lot. A lot of scripture this morning. So Paul is saying, hey, the law is good. It's perfect. It's holy. And it, and, and it was supposed to bring life in this old covenant with God. It was supposed to lead us to him. But instead, because we were sinful, it ended up bringing death. Just like Adam and Eve from the beginning, sin twisted what God's good command was. Hey, you can eat all this, don't touch this. That was a good command. And sin twisted that and aroused their desire to say, I want that. I want that. Have you ever told a kid not to do something? What do they usually do? Do it. It makes them want to do it more. Have you ever told a teenager not to do something? Wants to, wants, they want to do it all the more. Have you walked past a sign that says, do not touch wet paint? There is a deepness inside of us, and me included, that I just want to thrust my whole body on the wall. Why? Why do we do that? It's sin. It is sin in us. And the things we can't have, we want more. The things we can't do, we want to do more. See, the law, God's commands, told us what not to do. Therefore, we wanted to do those things more. It aroused, sin took advantage of. Not only that, but, but for the Israelites and for us, the more laws that God gave, the more opportunities we have to break them. If there was no law, nothing would be broken. If there was one law, all we could do is break one. But the more laws that God tried to give us just presented more opportunities for us to sit. Why? Did the law cause my death then? Of course not, Paul says. The laws are good and they show God's wisdom, but they also exposed Israel's inability to be God's faithful partners. And ultimately, it exposed our inability to be God's faithful partners because we're sinners. The law didn't make us sin. Sin made us sin. Sin made us sin. So Paul picks up the trouble in verse 14. The trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. Turn to your neighbor and say, your trouble. The, tr the trouble is with me. Some of you guys were too real with that. Tone it down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the trouble is with me. I'm all too human. I'm a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know what I'm going to do is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing it. It is the sin living in me that does it. Paul states very clearly the law is not the problem. We are the problem. The law does not make us sinners. It just reveals how sinful we already are. Laws, God's law, even though it was holy and perfect and good, it could not fix a fundamental problem, and that's us. It couldn't fix us. It couldn't change our sinful hearts. It couldn't change our sinful nature, as good and as holy as it is. It couldn't fix the sin in us. Paul continues in verse 18, and I know that nothing good lives in me that is my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. 
I want to do what is, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. That is a tongue twister. Try to read this verse very fast. I've, re- I've discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me slave to the sin that is within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Has anyone ever felt that way? What is wrong with me? I love God's laws. I know what is right and wrong, but I don't do what I should do, and I do what I shouldn't do. Who am I? How miserable am I? There's more power. This, and this is the Apostle Paul talking here, one that we would put head and shoulders in a relationship with God above our relationship with God. And he is stating still, there's, there's this tug, there's this, this battle. Modern translation for this, the struggle is real. The struggle is real at this, my sinful nature pulling this way and, and my desire to follow God and be and keep that covenant relationship the opposite. I love God's laws, but I don't follow them. Verse 24 there, Paul says uh, that he is miserable. Another translation would say wretched. The, the original Greek word that he uses here is referring specifically to someone who is exhausted and weary after a battle. It would describe a person with severe side effects from great ongoing strain. What a picture. That's what happens when we live a lifestyle of of trying and putting so much effort in doing and following the commands and X, Y, Z. What could be more miserable than us exerting all of our energy to try to live a good life only to discover that the best we can do is still not good enough. The best we can do doesn't even come close. And we are truly miserable when we think that what we can do, our own strength, our own obedience can save us. That makes for a miserable life because deep down, we're like Paul going, what is wrong with me? I can't do it. Uh, Let me illustrate it this way. Pastor Zach said I have a dad bod, but I go to the gym. So I got some dad strength. But I go to the gym and I love going to the gym because in my mind, it is one of the most interesting social places you can go on the planet. You see some weird stuff at the gym and you interact with some weird people. And I love it. That's just the type of person I am. And I've gone to the gym And I love seeing people there because it's like, good for you. Like I'm an encourager to the core. I'm like, let's go. You're in here. You're out here grinding. You're trying to get healthy. You're trying to get fit, whatever. But you also see a lot of times people do some weird things or do some weird workouts. All right. I was in the gym uh, and in in the past month, I've seen one guy specifically. He comes into the gym. And, and this is all he does. He goes and lays on a bench and he grabs a 40 pound dumbbell. Now these, these are hundred pound dumbbell, dumbbells I have up here. So just, uh, just know that. But he grabs a 40 pounder and he lays on the bench and I call it the unicorn curl. He puts that stinker on his head, laying flat and he goes like violently like this. And it's not meant to be an ab workout. He's like trying to work out his neck. Then he'll lay on his stomach and he'll put that dumbbell on his neck and he'll throw his arms out like this and he'll go. (laughs) And I, I kid you, I like laugh out loud. I'm like, dude, you are about to hurt your neck. Like every time he does that, he needs to go to the chiropractor after. I mean, geez. So we have people that are in there and they're, they're doing the right thing the wrong way. If I was gonna do a, 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 just a bicep curl, and I gotta be careful because I will rip this suit right out of the arms. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a dad joke. But if I wanted to do this, I, I know that I need to keep my elbows a little bit back. I'm not gonna move them at all. 
and I'm going to isolate my bicep, and I'm working out my bicep. Now I see big tough guys go in the gym, and they grab more weight than they should because they want to look bigger, and they go like this. <sighs> ah, yeah. That's not working their bicep out at all. It's actually hurting their back. They're doing the right workout the wrong way. They're using the right things the wrong way. This is our relationship with the law that God put in place. It is good. It's meant to help us. It's meant to be holy, but we use it the wrong way. And when we use the law the wrong way, it only brings hurt and pain and honestly a waste of time. Because the law was never meant to save us. The law couldn't save us and it couldn't change us, but we use this self-righteousness in our own lives all the time. If I can just, if I can just do it right, this will be good enough for God. If I'm outside of a Sunday, if I just tithe enough, I'll be good. And you're just hurting yourself and wasting your time and honestly wasting God's time. That's the law was never meant for that. Instead of using the law to show us our sin, we tried to use it to remove our sin. We do all these things and fulfill all these checklists and these commands that God would say, and we think that makes us holy and saved and good. In fact, it doesn't. And we're using the law the wrong way, and it hurts us and not helps us. You know, using the law wrong, like I said, it's, it, it, it's thinking that we can become holy, stay in this relationship with God by our own strength. We know all through scripture that's not the case. We can't. Apostle Paul just laid it out. I can't do it, even though I want to. I can't save myself because of my sinful nature. The law couldn't save me either. I would have to be perfect. The law does not expel sin, it magnifies it. And if we try to live by the law, then you will die by the law. If we try to live by our actions and our works and just doing good and being a good person, we'll die that way too. See, when you use the law the wrong way, it does two things, it makes you two things, either one or the other or both. When you use the law to save you, it'll turn you into a fake, because you can't do it. You cannot fulfill all the commands. You cannot fulfill it. You're not good enough. You have a sinful nature, no matter how hard you try. So therefore, you'll realize you can't do it, and you'll start to pretend to do it. That was the Pharisees in a nutshell. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs, because on the outside, they were faking it. On the inside, they were dead. So you either become a fake, or you become a failure. I can't do it, I'll never be good enough, I have a sinful nature, and I try and I try and then I just crash and burn. And I'll just repeat a cycle of just failing because I cannot ever be good enough or do enough to save me. I get turned into an actor or an addict. We have to use the law that God put in place for what it is. The law is not a vehicle to God, it is the directions to God. It shows us what God wants, it shows us what we need in our life, but it can never take us there. That's why Jesus had to come to fulfill the law, and he is the only vehicle. He says, I am the only way that you get to God. He's the only way, not by ourselves, not by our works, so that we could boast but by the free gift that he gives us of grace. Jesus is the vehicle to God, not our works. Our works could never get us there. Galatians 2, 19, worship team, would you come at this time? Galatians 2, 19 says, for when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. 
If keeping the law, if doing everything right could make us right with God, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. He wouldn't have had to die and give us grace and forgive us and save us. Jesus' death on the cross made that new covenant with God through himself. And now we need to depend on him for that instead of ourselves. But just like Paul said at the beginning, he gave us this theme, like I said, that death changes the relationship. Death changes the relationship. And there had to be some death that had to happen to change the relationship with us to the law. Death had to happen to change a relationship between me and Jesus. And death had to happen between me and myself. Jesus had to die. And through Jesus' death, it changed my relationship with the law. I no longer needed it. I just need him and he set me free. I have to die to the law. I do, just like Paul said, not the law dying. I die to the law because I'm delivered from it. Why? Because the law cannot exercise authority over a dead person doesn't apply to them any longer. I mean, stop trying to get saved by your actions. Start depending on Jesus. But the last one, and this is the hardest one, the death that needed to happen is die to ourselves. We have to die to ourselves in order to change the relationship with ourselves. In 2004, something major happened in the world. Phones had been out by this time. And this is the first time that they put a camera on this side of it so I could take pictures of myself. I could take self pictures. Do you know what that's called? A selfie in 2004. And actually that year, the Oxford, for, uh, the Oxford uh, Dictionary made selfie the word of the year. And humanity ran with it. We obviously loved the selfie. Hello. We loved it. We love going places, taking selfies. No longer taking it out there. I'm taking it in here. I'm looking at myself. I love seeing people go, if you go to a national park or somewhere gorgeous with a beautiful view, you see people walk up and they're like, oh, this is breathtaking. I could stare at this forever. You know what? I'm gonna capture a picture of it so I can look at it forever. Uh, hold on. Hello. <laughs> like. Look at this beautiful view. Let me put my big fat head right in the middle of it. The selfie. We loved it and we still love it. In fact, if you have a big family picture that you're in and somebody shows you, you know who you look at first? You. You. All the Zoom stuff going on, you know what video you look at most? You. It's not just a trend. It's who we are. We're sinful. That's what sin is. It's selfishness. It's only looking inward. It's looking at myself, for myself, because of myself. Doing the best for me, what I want to do, when I want to do it, because I deserve it. And we think that Satan came into this life that, and that he's in this battle with God because he's trying to get our focus off of Jesus and focus on him. That's not the case. Satan came into this world to, to take your eyes off Jesus and not look at him, but make you look at yourself. He wants you focused inward. In Matthew 16, 24, it says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. I need to, it, 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 another translation says, I need to deny myself and take up my cross, die to myself daily. But this verse is often very misused. They think I'm gonna, I, I hear people say, I'm carrying my cross today. Man, I got this health issue. I got this burden, this, this something going wrong in my, and Jesus called me just to carry that cross. I'm gonna carry that burden. No, that's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying the cross, what it was and what it is, is that it was an instrument of death. It wasn't a burden to carry, it caused you to die. It was a tool to carry out capital punishment. It was a killing device and it was good at it. 
And Jesus is saying it's not some piece of jewelry because that would be weird in that time to wear a cross around your neck. That would be like wearing a guillotine or a noose or an electric chair as jewelry today. It wasn't something to be proud of, it was shameful. And Jesus was saying, hey, if you really wanna follow me, you need that cross every day. What is he saying, you carry a burden every day? No, he's saying you die every day. You die every day. Who dies? I die. Carrying my cross every day, it means the other, the other night I was talking to Jesus and he said, you know what? I don't really like Luke Spangrud. He's leading Luke Spangrud wrong. He's selfish, he's sinful. Luke Spangrud isn't the best for Luke Spangrud. Let's kill him. Let's kill him. I said, you're right. I need to kill Luke Spangrud. I need to kill his plans, his dreams, his desires, his needs, his wants, his perspective. I need to kill his way. Otherwise, I can't follow Jesus. He gets in the way. And we need to die every day. That's what carrying my cross means. And this is not the popular part of following Jesus, nor is it the easy one, but it's the most necessary. Because Jesus didn't come to enhance your life. He didn't come to add to what you already had going on. He came to save you from yourself. He came to kill you. It's an interesting way of putting it, kind of morbid, but it's true. I need to die. And death not only changed the relationship with myself, but death brings deliverance. Only through death am I brought deliverance. Deliverance from the law, deliverance in Jesus to salvation, and deliverance from myself and the power of sin. Romans 8, verse 12 says, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by, it, by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live, you will be delivered. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The problem is we don't want to die to ourselves, but everywhere the theme of Scripture and Jesus saying, I need the Holy Spirit to help me kill myself, kill things in me every day. But I like selfie mode. I like looking inward because I deserve it. I'm this, I'm that, nah. uh that's not what Jesus says. A.W. Tozer puts it perfect. He says, after we accept Christ, we want to do all of our living and only expect Christ to do all the dying. Mm -mm. Jesus did his dying. Now it's my turn. He did his part. Now it's my turn. If I really want to follow Jesus, he says, count the cost. It's going to cost you. My question for you this morning, church, that Jesus asked me, is if your relationship with Jesus hasn't cost you ever anything, have you really died to yourself? If your relationship with Christ hasn't cost you, I would argue you haven't died to yourself. Romans 12, 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. He says, put yourself as the sacrifice. I'm not just doing things for him anymore. I am the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they would build altars in places and to worship God and for the atonement of their sins, they would have to bring an animal and slaughter an animal. I'm thankful that Jesus was the perfect lamb and he got himself on the altar so I wouldn't have to do that anymore. But Paul brings this back into play and says, I don't think we should get rid of altars yet. Because he said, I think we should set up altars in our lives every day. And instead of bringing other things to them, that's where I go to die. I set up an altar every morning and I put myself on it, nobody else. I put my plans for the day on it. I put my time that day on it. I put my finances that day on it. I put my attitude, I put my sin on that altar every day. And the altar is where we meet God. And this, Paul says, that's how you really worship God is by sacrificing 
yourself. And I find it so interesting that Paul doesn't say sacrifice your sin. He says sacrifice yourself. How I worship God, how I live for him, how I be a child of God, I sacrifice everything. Whatever he wants me to do. Would you stand all across this place? It is a challenging and a tough thing to chew on. But through death, it changes our relationship with our sinful nature. Through when we kill ourselves, when, when we, through the Holy Spirit, kill these selfish things in us, then we live free. Then you truly live. Because living burdened by the power of the law, it's miserable. It's a miserable life. And it's a hard road, yes, to kill those things in your life, but is the only way to truly live in Jesus, to get off of selfie mode. So would you bow your heads? I just wanna give the Holy Spirit a moment to speak because there's places that need altars built in your life and things thrown on them. And I don't know exactly what those will, are or will be, but Jesus does and his Holy Spirit speaking to you right now. And I wanna give an opportunity if there's anybody in this place that you would say, man, I, I've never accepted Jesus' sacrifice for me. I, I, I've never actually given him my whole life. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that I'm a child of him in the family of God because I haven't accepted his sacrifice. I'm not living for him. And you wanna be saved this morning and make the best decision you could ever make. I just wanna pray with you and pray for you. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and look at me so I could pray for you. If you wanna go all in with Jesus this morning, go all in. Great, then we're all on the same page. And for the rest of us, for all of us here, there are things that need to die. So Jesus, Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts right now. We know what places we do wrong, just like Paul. We know the areas we should be following you in and we don't. We know the areas we should be staying away from and we do them anyways. Reveal to us the areas we need to die to ourselves. I just feel the Holy Spirit speaking so strongly to me right now that somebody in this place needs to die to, to, to their perspective on this country. You've put that above God. God is on the throne. Some people in this place, I feel like it's an attitude thing. Yes, that can be something that absolutely needs to die. Someone fear in this place. Someone needs to give their time on the altar. That if Jesus would call you to a quote interruption, before today you would say no. So Jesus, we thank you through your Holy Spirit that we get, you give us the power, you give us the direction, the truth, and the, 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 the leading of where we need to die. And we don't have to live alone. We don't do it on our own. We thank you and we celebrate the beautiful, perfect sacrifice that you sent your son as the sacrifice to die for us so we could be in a relationship with you. Now it's our turn, Jesus. We die too ourselves. In your mighty name. Amen. I just want to give a moment for the Holy Spirit to continue to work as you worship, as you sing about Jesus being your foundation. So we just take a moment, let the Holy Spirit work and talk to Him. Thank you once again, Holy Spirit. We don't do this struggle. We don't do this battle alone. And that when we die to ourselves, that's when freedom comes to truly and fully live for you. I pray that you'd speak to us every morning that we wake up, that you would speak to our hearts on how we can put ourselves on the altar every day, every hour, every moment. We thank you, Jesus, for how you're gonna use us when we stop looking at ourselves, focusing on you. Bless your church this week, God. Give us the strength and the courage to do what you're calling us to do as we walk in obedience. We love you, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.
the, re- the, the reality of this message is when you walk out those doors, that's when the death starts. That's when the dying begins. That's the best way we can live. Amen. Love you, church. Blessings on you.